Hi there, welcome back to the Dev All. I am Roman and this is the second episode of our event sourcing do-it-yourself video series. In the last episode, I gave you a small introduction to what event sourcing actually is and I told you my motivation why I think it is important that if you're starting with event sourcing or with any kind of new technique or pattern or architectural style that you actually implement it on your own, that you are doing it yourself. So this is what you're going to start right now. So, los geht's! So in the end of the last episode, I was telling you that for a really small MVP for an event source system, we need two things, events and an event store where we can actually store the events. And this is what we're going to build in this episode. So in order to, to have some events that we can actually store, we need a domain. So we need a domain where we are going to write a program for. And our domain is an ice cream truck. This is the same domain I used in the F Sharp introductory series, Clara's Parlor, and we use the same domain in this video series as well. And while we were modeling our really small and nice domain, we got four domain events out of it. So in our first iteration, these four domain events are the core of our domain of our business logic. These events are the first one is that we have a flavor like vanilla or strawberry and the flavor was restocked in our system. The second event was the flavor sold event, which means that we actually have sold one flavor out of our ice cream truck. The third event was that the flavor went out of stock. So we actually sold the last vanilla or strawberry flavor of our ice cream truck. The last event in here we have a flavor was not in stock event. A lot of people are not using actually domain events for these kinds of events. They are using exceptions for this because this is kind of an error in our system that someone wanted to get a flavor by an ice cream but they couldn't because it was not in stock. But I think that these kinds of domain errors are not an exception. They are not an exception of the rule. They are expected business behavior, domain behavior, because we want to know if something was out of stock. And our ice cream truck does not throw some random exception out of the window when some flavor was not in stock. So I think that this is a pretty important event and we need to model those error cases as well because they are important for our business. Now we want to actually implement those events in F Sharp. This is quite nice in a language like F Sharp because we have discriminated unions and we can pretty much just copy and paste those events and put them into F Sharp code. So, los geht's! So in the course of this video series we are going to build a small CLI program and this program is used just that we see all the output and everything that is happening in our program and in our event source system. It's not that fancy but I think it's enough to let us focus on the most important parts. So in here we have this program with which does not do anything and we want to actually put our domain in here. So our events we want to put in here. In this video series I will put everything into one file, into this program FS file. Normally we or you would split this up but for the sake of the simplicity of this video we will put everything into one file. We start with a new module and we call it domain. And this module has a type for our events. And for the type we use discriminated unions. So we have a event in here. And what we have is four events. The first event is our flavor sold event. And what kind of flavor? Well, some kind of flavor that we need to describe. Then there is the flavor was restocked event. So when when our ice cream tuck run out of, of, of a specific flavor, we can actually restock the flavor. And here we get a tuple of a flavor and an integer. So we want to know 
with how many portions we actually did restock our ice cream truck. The third event is the flavor went out of stock event. And also here we need to provide a specific flavor for this. And then we have the flavor was not in stock event which marks some error in our domain. Okay, now we also need to actually implement this flavor and because we have a very small example domain here, our ice cream tuck is only capable to provide us with two different flavors which are strawberry and vanilla. And that's it. Now we have defined our four domain events, flavor sold, flavor restocked, flavor went out of stock, flavor was not in stock and the flavors in about eight lines of code. Not too bad, I think, just to model the basic types of our domain. Okay, I think this was pretty simple. Now let's move to the not so simple part of this video. We are going to implement an actual event store. What is an event store? An event store, it's just a data structure that consists of two functions. The first function is called get and get takes a unit parameter, so actually no parameter at all, and returns a list of events, which are all the events that are currently stored within our event store. And the second function is the append function. And this function takes a list of events and returns nothing because internally it appends all the events of this list to the, the current state of the event store, to the current list of the events. That's it. There is no function that can actually mutate the event, that can actually delete the events. This is not possible in general in event sourcing. So if we take those two functions again in F sharp, it's pretty easy to actually implement this type. So we have a type called event store for some generic event. So that's why there is this event with a little thingy up there. And this is, in this case, just a record with two functions, get, which is just copied from up there, and append. And the question now is, how do we actually implement this event store? And for this, we are using an approach or a nice thing that the F-Sharp language actually provides us, which is a mailbox processor or an agent. And to be able to explain to you how a mailbox processor or an agent actually works if you have never actually worked with them, I'm going to draw you a small diagram and I hope that you're good prepared afterwards to actually implement such a mailbox processor together with me. So we are going to implement our event store with a mailbox processor or an agent. What is this? What is an agent? An agent is a possibility to create a small encapsulated unit, unit which sits somewhere in its own thread maybe, in its own process, and wait for messages to arrive. And the nice thing is that all this is, is done asynchronously, so we don't block our whole system. And the second thing is that, that it's very cheap to actually create a lot of those mailbox processes, and we can send them a lot of messages, and the system takes care that each message is actually processed one by one. So they're actually queued and we are sure that there are no race conditions. We, we don't need to, to put some locks or mutexes or something on there to protect the state of these mailbox processors. We know that each message is actually processed separately one after the other. So how does this look like? So for example, we have a mailbox processor here, this is our mailbox processor. And this is an actor, let's say. So we have here an actor. We don't need this. And each actor has a defined set of messages that it can actually process. And 
for our mailbox, uh, sorry, for our event store, we know that we, that we have to actually implement a specific interface, which is two functions. And these functions are get and append. Get is unit and returns an event list. And append takes an event list and returns nothing. And now we want to build an actor or a mailbox processor that can actually work with this. So for example, here in such a mailbox processor or in such a system, we can have different clients. We have one client, two, and three. And now each client can send messages to our actor. And the nice thing now is that those messages are not coming all at the same time, but there is kind of a funnel or a queue in here where all the messages of all the actors are queued. So now the actor is actually able to take the first message out of the queue, which is the blue one in here, and it opens the message. And in here, in this message, we find the message append and we want to append one event. Now the question is, to what do we want to actually append this? And we want it to append to the current state of the actor. So before the message arrives, the current state of the actor might be just an empty list. And now it receives the first message that it wants to process. So now, it appends the one event, the E1 event, to the list. Now the mailbox processor can actually process the second message. And this is also an append. And now we want to append two more events, E2 and E3. And because in here we have this state, we just append those two messages to the current state of the actor. Really nice. Now this message is processed and now the last message in here comes in. This message is different than the other ones because in here we have the get message. So now this client here wants to have the current state of the actor and it wants to get the current state back. But now I said everything what is in here is asynchronous. It's just a message-based system, so we don't really know, the actor does not really know how to actually send back the current state to the client. And therefore, within the get message, there needs to be something called reply, which is a channel on which the actor then can actually send back the state to the client. So now we can actually have some reply channel here. And it, this is opened now because the actor knows about this. And on this reply channel, we can actually send the whole current state of the actor back to the client. And this is how an actor or a mailbox processor works. And this is what we're going to implement now in our system. Los geht's. All right. I hope that the whole concept of the mailbox processor or an agent is much clearer now after I've showed you this diagram. So now we are going to actually implement such a mailbox processor in F Sharp, and this will be the basis for our event store. So first of all, we are going to implement a new module, which I call infrastructure. And in this module, we are going to define some types and especially the type for our event store. So if you remember the slides and, and the image, the, the diagram, you remember that we have an event store of some type event. And this event store is defined by two functions, which are get, which is called to unit and it returns a list of those events and of course here we have to write down unit and the second function is append which gives us a event list and returns 
again. Nothing. All right. Now we have the type. And now we actually want to, to implement this event store. And in the end, we want to build a small CLI program that, that uses this event store as our nice UI uh, in, this, in this video series. So what do we want to achieve? Down here, we have our main part. And down here, we want to actually initialize an event store. So open here, we open the infrastructure module. And here we say, okay, our event store should be of type event store for our events that we have defined up here in our domain. And this one, we initialize this by calling a thing called event store, which we haven't done yet. And we need to call some function that we are going to call initialize. So we don't know the event type yet because we haven't opened the domain in here. So now that we have done this, we see that now we have here an event store of type event. We haven't implemented it yet, but we still, we already have the interface up here, so we can use it. And we want to use it in a very specific way. We want to say, for example, event store. So we see those are the two functions that we can actually call in our event store. So we want to append, for example, a flavor was flavor restocked event for the flavor vanilla and with the number three. And then we can actually append some more events. I copied them here. So we append some events like flavor of salt vanilla. We have sold three vanillas. And after this, the flavor vanilla went out of stock. And then in the end, we want to actually get all the events out of the event store. So we want to say event store dot get. And with those events, I want to actually print them out nicely to the command line. So we call a helper function called print event. And this print event function is defined in a small helper module I put up here. I'm not going through, through it too much. We're just taking the events and print them out nicely in an unordered list uh, onto the CLI. And to be able to use this, we also need to open the helper module. If you want to go through all of this, all the code, as I said, is on GitHub. So you can actually check each step in the given repository. So this is the API we are going to use. So the only thing, <laughs> not the smallest thing, but the only thing we actually need to do is to build this event store initialize function. So let's do this. Up here within the infrastructure module, we implement another module here and we call it event store. What I have done now is that I prepared a template for the implementation of a mailbox processor because I don't want to write it down here step by step. I copy it in here and then I go through it so that you can understand it. And later on, we are going to implement all the bits and pieces that are necessary to transform this Mailbox processor into a full-blown event store. All right. So now I'm going to paste this in here. And we have quite some code in here, which looks maybe a bit strange in the beginning. But we are going to through this together. And I hope that in the end, you are going to understand what a Mailbox processor is and how it actually works. As you have seen in the, in the diagram, each mailbox processor can process a specific set of messages. And these messages are normally implemented via another discriminated union. So in this type here, we call message, we define what the mailbox processor can actually do. And in this case, it's the mailbox processor that can increment a counter. Very simple, very basic. And then we can send another message to the mailbox processor. And this message has a reply channel in it. 
So in the diagram, I've shown you that the message needs to integrate a, a reply channel on which we can actually answer our clients. And we need to tell the reply channel what type are we going to return onto this reply channel. So if we ask the mailbox processor for the current state, we use the async reply channel and we get back an integer. And then down here, we have all the, the boilerplate, so to say, that we need to implement an actual mailbox processor. So we call this agent here, and then we use the static method of the mailbox processor class that F -sharp nicely has implemented for us. And this function takes one parameter, and this parameter itself is a function. So it's a lambda function in this case here. So in this function, which goes all the way down to here, takes an inbox. And with this inbox, the mailbox processor or the agent can actually wait for the next message to arrive. So then we need to define a recursive function. And this recursive function is called by the mailbox processor itself again and again and again after it processed one message. So it waits for a message to arrive, then it actually waits or it calls itself and it waits for the next message to arrive and to process. In here, we see that there is one parameter. I called it state in here. And the state can be pretty much everything you want. It can be a list, an integer, a complex data structure, doesn't matter. But this state is changed or can be changed after one message arrived and is processed. And then when we call the next iteration of the loop or the recursive loop function, we put the state back into the next iteration of the loop function. So in our case, if we look just down here, we see that we to, to actually start the agent, we, we have the initial call to the loop function with an integer with a seed value, so to say. And in this case, it's zero because this mailbox processor can only increment values. So then in this loop function, we have an async block. What this means is it's, it's a computation expression and you can read about it. But in here, what it actually means is that the whole agent, the whole mailbox processor works asynchronously. So it sits there on a specific thread and waits four messages to arrive and the whole program is not blocked while the, the actual mailbox processor or agent waits for another me message or processes them. So then here we use the inbox.receive method of the inbox and in here this is the point where we are going to wait for the next message to arrive and if you see this here and you have never seen this so-called let bang so it's a let with an exclamation mark. If you, if you know C Sharp or JavaScript, it's the same as an await in an asynchronous function or method. So this is similar to if we have an async function in C Sharp and then we put an await before in front of a variable, this is pretty much the same. So inbox receive returns an async of message and because we say await or let bang, in this case, the only thing that we have is a message. And because we have a message, we can do pretty simple patternage over the message. So in the increment case, we just call the loop again with the incremented state. Because the state is an integer, we can just, in this case, increment it by one. And here, this is what I've said, we call the recursive function again. If you have never seen this return in here, it's necessary for the async block. So because th this is just an object, the async, so to say, that, that describes an asynchronous action, we need to somehow return a value out of this asynchronous action. And because this one here is already an async, because the loop function returns this whole async expression here. We use the return bang, which says, okay, whatever 
is returned in here is an async so don't wrap it again in an async and just return it so if we want to actually get the current state out of the mailbox processor we can send the message current state to the agent and we supply a reply channel and we can then call the reply method of this reply channel with the current state and because we don't want the mailbox processor to stop waiting for messages which would actually happen if I don't call the loop function again in here we call the loop function again with the state that we haven't touched and this is how we can actually implement a mailbox processor so now that we have defined this we could actually use two different functions of the mailbox processor. The first one could be agents.post and post is the way to send a message to a mailbox processor. So I could say post the message increment to the mailbox processor and then this would run and increment this value. If we want to actually get the value out of a mailbox processor, we could say let value equals, and then we can say agent.pose and reply. And what is happening now is that this post and reply needs a lambda function, which actually gets the reply channel put in there by the mailbox processor. And then we could say the current state with the reply in there. And because the current state itself, it's just a function, it's a constructor function that only takes the parameter reply, we can get rid of the lambda in here and we can just call it like this, that we call the agent post and reply function with the message current state and we get back an integer. Nice. Now we want to make use of this new knowledge and build our first version of our nice event store. So the first thing I'd like to do is always work with the API. So the API of the mailbox processor is this type here, where we define the possible messages. So in our case, we have two messages. We have the append, and in here, we want to append some kind of events. So a list of events. And because we use a generic parameter here, we also need to use this generic parameter in the type definition. And then we want to use the get, which is actually an async reply channel of an event list. Okay, now we need to fix those errors here because we have changed our message type. So the first one is append and we get a list of events wrapped in our append case here. So now we call the recursive function again and we need to fix our state. So we want to have these events and events is a list of events and we want to append these events to the end of the current history of our event store. So we could actually change this here that we are not using an integer but we could say okay the initial seed value of our event store is a list and we call this here history not state anymore because now we have a history of events and if we have this history we can actually append the events that we get to the list of the events so the add operator here appends the second list to the first list so now we have implemented our first message now we want to implement our get and this is pretty much the only thing that we need to change is the name of the message because here the get only gets an async reply channel of an event list and because this here is an event list the, the history we can just reply the state and call our recursive function again now we could say here for example that we need to pose some events and these events are here so we say append some kind of event, such a list, for example. And we could make a function out of it. So we could say let append event equal. So now we say agent post append the events. And now we have a function that takes some list and appends this to the agent. And now we also want to create a function called get. So let's do this and say let get. And this function takes a unit and says then here the agent post and reply get. 
And that's it, pretty much. Now we have defined two functions that defines the API of our mailbox processor. So we don't always need to call agent.post and agent.post and reply. And now the, the nice thing is we have this interface up here, the event store. So let's actually return something that implements this interface. So we could build our initialize function that we had called down here. So let's do this now. We say initialize. And what is initialize doing? Initialize actually returns an event store for some generic events. So, and then we can indent all this here, one bit. And now we've defined our agent within our initialize function. And we have our two functions here that can implement the API because down here, the thing this function is actually returning is a record that has a get function. The get function is our get. And then we have the append function and the append function is our append. And voila, as you can see, everything is green up here. And now we return an event store for some event. Okay, let's go down here and see why this is not working. It says this value is not a function and cannot be applied. Okay, which means our initialize function here is not actually a function but it is a value and this is not what we want. We want to make it callable. So we put a unit parameter up here and now we can actually call our function. And as you see, everything is green. So let's actually run our program .net run. And as you can see here, we now have this nice um, UI where, where we get a list of all the events that are defined in our system. Here we see that we put five events in our system, flavor restocked, sold, 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 and flavor went out of stock. And this is actually also the order. So all the events were just appended to the event store. Nice. So now we have actually defined our first event store in our system. Just to show you that it actually appends all the values. If I put uh, something up here like strawberry and run this program again, we see now that we have a sixth event in this event store, which is flavor sold strawberry, which was just appended to the other events. All right, great. We have just implemented the first version of our given very small but fully functional event store. And I think this is pretty cool. But now the question is, how can we actually work with the information that we have stored in those events? Because for now, we have just put them somewhere to sleep. But the question is, how can we actually do something with those events? And the answer to this question is projections. And this is what we're going to talk about in the next episode of this event sourcing do-it-yourself video series. I hope you liked this episode. If you liked it, give me a subscribe, hit me up on Twitter, ask me any questions you like. I try to answer them the best as I can. So see you next time. Bye-bye.